Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from for the launch of today's flagship report, The State of Women and Leadership in Global Health. We're about to get started with this webinar. We'll just give participants one or two minutes to join, and then we'll start the conversation. So please just stand by. Okay, great. I think we can get started with uh, today's webinar. As I said earlier, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us uh, from today for the launch of this flagship report, The State of Women and Leadership in Global Health, The XX Paradox, published by Women in Global Health. This report exposes the shocking underrepresentation of women in global health leadership. Despite the fact that women hold around 70% of health worker jobs globally, over 80% of nursing roles, and over 90% of midwifery roles, the fact that women deliver the majority of unpaid care and domestic work in families and communities and make the majority of health purchasing and usage decisions, the fact that women lead the delivery of health to 5 billion people and contribute an estimated 3 trillion annually to global health, women only hold 25% of leadership roles in health. My name is Yvonne Dege and I'm an international journalist, moderator and host who will be leading the conversation and discussion on today's report, bringing together health leaders to discuss the actions needed to transform the current unacceptable status quo. We have a powerful and dynamic lineup of speakers and guests for our panel discussion. So let's get started with today's event. But before we do, there are some housekeeping rules that we all need to observe. Today's webinar is being simultaneously translated into French and Spanish. If you do pick a different language channel, please remain in it for the duration of the webinar as switching between channels can sometimes cause problems for the interpreters. Throughout this 75 minute webinar, we want to hear from you, the participants. So please introduce yourself in the chat and say where you are. Make sure you're sending your chat messages to everyone and not just the panelists. There's an option to adjust this setting in the chat box. Use the question and answer function or the Q&A function to send your questions for our speakers, which will be monitored and incorporated into the discussion. Share your thoughts on Twitter using the hashtag SheShapes. That's hashtag SheShapes. And finally, the report can now be downloaded from the Women in Global Health website, and we will also share it in the chat box. So let's get going. I'd like to start by introducing Dr. Rupa Dart, the co-founder and executive director of Women in Global Health, a leading voice in the movement to correct the gender imbalance in global health leadership. She's also a practicing internal medicine physician at Georgetown University in Washington, DC, and has faculty appointments as an assistant professor at Georgetown University and the University of Miami. Over to Dr. Rupa for the opening remarks and to present some of the findings from this report. Thank, thank you, Yvonne, uh, for uh, this introduction and uh, a really a warm welcome to all of our speakers, all of our audience for joining us for today's launch. Up, up, up. Uh, if you can, I'm sorry, uh, I just see the slide uh, deck up, if we can just hold off on that for a second. Thank you. Uh, uh, again, everyone for joining today's launch for the policy report on the state of women and leadership in global health and to discuss our findings and conclusions. Women in Global Health was launched in 2015 and we found ourselves asking the question, why are there so many incredible women in global health but so few in leadership positions? In 2023, our fast growing global movement has 47 national chapters and we are still asking the same question. Since 2015, we have done significant evidence gathering, campaigning, 
and mobilizing on this issue, supporting the work of the World Health Organization and other global organizations and working with a large number of partners in the field. In 2021, Women in Global Health was proud to launch the Gender Equal Health and Care Workforce Initiative, which we co-lead with France, because we recognize that health systems cannot function without the work of women. At the same time, we recognize that gender inequities in the health workforce, including in leadership, reduce the morale of women workers and also mean that the health systems are not fully benefiting from the talent and professional knowledge of women in the health workforce. Promoting equal participation of men and women in health leadership is a key pillar of that initiative, which now has support of 47 partners, including 16 governments. So the policy report we are launching today builds on existing momentum for change and a body of work. In this research, we have taken a deeper dive into women's leadership in health in India, Kenya, and Nigeria to complement the global picture. And while we started mobilizing in 2015, we know that the work must continue. On that note, I am very excited to be able uh, to share our report, and I kindly ask the team um, if you can please pull up the slides. Okay, great. I, I can go ahead and see the slides here. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Today, we are launching the policy report covering the global data on women's leadership and health, drawing on three country case studies from Nigeria, India, and Kenya. We will be publishing all three country case studies later in the year as the research reports. Next slide, please. All of this has happening in the context of work that is happening at the global level to really build the momentum and inspire action. Last year, the World Health Organization launched the new version of the Working for Health Action Plan 2022 to, 20, uh, to 2030, which cites ensuring equal representation in women in decision-making and planning processes as a critical success factor. Next slide, please. Our analysis finds that progress has stalled and women still hold only 25% of leadership positions. Global health is still delivered by women and led by men. Since we first did the macro analysis in 2018, the situation has fluctuated with a slight increase in the proportion of Fortune 500 healthcare companies led by women. However, it is concerning that the percentage of female ministers of health and uh, female um, if we can please go back to, uh, to the previous slide, and percentages of the World Health delegations led by women has decreased. So this is quite notable that we've seen uh, progress in, in the private sector, but whereas it comes to the decision-making process, especially uh, in governments, as well as in the global governance at the World Health uh, Assembly, women are less represented than they were before. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Women's place in health leadership varied significantly between Kenya, Nigeria, and India. Next slide, please. What we can see is that um, specifically looking at Kenya, India, and Nigeria, um, in Kenya particularly, the highly patriarchal culture, but women make up 42% of mid-level and 40% of top-level leadership positions in the health sector. Um, in India, women average 28% leadership roles across national health organizations, but averages are misleading since some organizations have almost no women in leadership positions. In Nigeria, around 33% leadership roles in health organization are held by women, but only five out of 30 national minister commissioners and only one out of the 28 directors of federal medical centers are women. So what we can tell by this is that while we might look at aggregate numbers and the picture doesn't look so uh, grim, when we go ahead and disaggregate that and look it into context, we are seeing there is significant uh, lack of women's representation in these countries at the highest levels. Next slide, please. What we have learned from the pandemic is that women have lost ground in leadership in the pandemic as gender stereotypes of men as natural leaders took hold. And it was clear that the pandemic was a high profile and powerful area to work in. Some of the examples include uh, last year uh, when the WHO executive board convened, which is comprised of member states, only 6% of the delegates were women. 
again, if you compare that um, to numbers we've seen at, at the highest number is about 30%. This is a significant dip. Another study that was released uh, by Women in Global Health was that we found early in the early days, looking at the COVID-19 national task teams that were forming around the world, uh, we mapped over 115 uh, task teams, and we found that 85% of those were majority men. Next slide, please. But when we're looking at these issues, we must always apply an intersectional approach. We find some groups of women, for example, women community health workers are often most excluded from decision making. At the global level, women from the global south are particularly underrepresented. Some of the examples that we want to highlight is um, especially women that are uh, migrant workers, uh, women from um, uh, minority racial groups um, are often uh, facing some of the most difficult, challenging circumstances and, and facing um, patient roles, but in reality, they have very little say in the decision making that is happening and uh, in delivering uh, the, the decisions around uh, the health systems. Next slide, please. One of our most substantial findings was that the similarity in qualitative data describing the challenges experienced by women in India, Kenya, and Nigeria. And while there are different contexts, we realize that many of the gender uh, biases and root drivers of gender inequities, there are many universalities across these countries. Our qualitative data from over 100 respondent, respondents confirms action is needed at all levels to change powerful gender norms and biases that discriminate against women in their homes, workplaces, and societies. Next slide, please. As we talk about gender norms and roles and how they limit women's participation at work and leadership, it's shown in these quotes. I'm gonna go ahead and read a couple of them just to demonstrate how extensive it is. Since childhood, I've only heard this as a gospel truth. Women's primary job is to take care of the household. It is difficult to keep challenging this notion, even internally, when everyone around you keeps saying this. When I got married, my mother-in-law was very explicit and told me that the job is to seva or serve my husband and my future son, a physician from India. You know, our cultural environment does not really support women as self-starters. We're always taught to follow instead of lead. It takes a lot to overcome that doctor in Nigeria. If you don't have a good spouse who is supportive, you will stop working. We have had women who have stopped working because the spouse said, no, you cannot go here. You cannot go to work. A lecturer from Kenya. Next slide, please. Secondly, how women experience discrimination linked to the motherhood penalty, which affects not only mothers, even women without children can be disadvantaged in career progression by the assumption that they will have children in the future and therefore are less suitable for promotion than their male peers. And so we call this the motherhood penalty. Again, some more examples from, from our country cases. So you turn down a lot because of pregnancy and because of also nurturing, you know, uh, nursing the baby. By the time you come back, you find that things have moved. It takes a lot of effort to come back. Doctor from Kenya. Some things are really critical for us women. I know two women who have postpartum depression and nobody seems to understand them. Doctor from Nigeria. The time post delivery was particularly traumatic for me. I was torn between caring for my child and thoughts about precarious position at work. Nurse in India. Next slide, please. Our research confirmed that global commitments are not being implemented fast enough or with enough accountability at the national level. And these are some other uh, examples uh, of gender stereotypes around leadership that deter and pe uh, penalize women. Um, reading some of the quotes here again, I've been called emotional and several times, which has fo uh, forced me to step back and put myself forward in leadership positions. Doctor from India, women often feel excluded and left out in the workplace due to certain unique qualities they possess. It tends to diminish her voice and make her discouraged. Professor from India. The women you find are the ones being told to serve tea because it's what the society is used to. Even when a woman is in a leadership position, they're told they cannot speak too much. You cannot be assertive just because of the society. Clinical officer in Kenya. Next slide, please. And so governments have made global commitments to gender equality and decision-making, but these will only drive change when implemented. Examples of commitments include commitments in the Sustainable Development Goals and in many other uh, national levels. Our research confirmed that global commitments are not being implemented with enough accountability. In Kenya, the constitution decrees that not more than um, 
uh, two thirds of the members of the elected public bodies should be uh, the same gender, yet this is not a reality. Labor laws in Nigeria allow for a three month maternity leave, but it is not universal. If you're a nurse and you have a baby, the government will not provide anything for you. In India, has a Provincial of Sexual Harassment Act to address workplace sexual harassment by lax teeth. Uh, an example, quote, I went to my supervisor with my complaint of sexual harassment. Not only did he overlook my complaint, but I was harassed to such an extent by the administration that I had to ultimately quit the hospital. Next slide, please. As long as societal gender barriers are not addressed, uh, systemic biases against women continue. Men, the vast majority of health leaders at national level, will continue to dominate global health decision making. Next slide, please. Women are shaping leadership in health, but not all recognized and rewarded. Uh, some examples um, here is if you're a leader, you should be able to mentor others who are around you to be able to either come to the same level that you're in and even surpass that level. And leadership for me means um, innovation. Also, you should be able to come up with new ideas. Nurse from Kenya. I think to be a leader, one should be able to empathize and be approachable. Women are good leaders, in my opinion, because they're usually emotional and they connect with people sensitively. Head of Department India. Leadership is about seeing, setting an example and leading with care. You have to set an example and become a guiding light and source of strength for future generations of women. I think of both as a personal and political goal. Doctor from India. As you can see, women from all these different backgrounds aspire to be viewed and valued as leaders, but are not all recognized and rewarded. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So as we dive into the recommendations, uh, the key areas that we uh, really see uniquely is uh, enable diverse women to lead, create tailored leadership opportunities for women from marginalized backgrounds. Number two, fast track actions to redress gender inequality in global health leadership. All women's shortlists, quotas, rotational leadership are interim measures, but should be taken. Three, increase visibility of women in health, create lists, database, and platforms to raise the profile of women in health. Next slide, please. Four, mobilize men to lean out and step up as allies and end the male bonus syndrome. Number five, end the default, main, uh, default male bias, prioritize implementation of and accountability for policies that support women's lives. Six, women's movements must be supported to accelerate collective action, particularly targeted funding in support of women's organizations to support the establishment of political networks for women and allies. Next slide. And finally, we must deepen our understanding and strengthen the evidence base for policy with more research and data. We need to generate more disaggregate data to understand the way different disadvantages intersect with sex and gender identity. We need targeted research with men to understand why bias persists and how to mobilize allyship. And three, continue to build evidence based on how sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment adversely impact women and leadership. All future research should be taking an intersectional approach. We must be fixing systems, uh, not fixing women. Our final message is that we need to focus exactly on the disadvantages women are facing instead of having them fit into systems that are not supporting them. So on that note, I am delighted to launch our policy report and I turn to our uh, panel uh, to continue the deep dive on the discussion. Thank you. And thank you to the entire team, um, as well as our chapters from these countries and the community of researchers we have engaged uh, to supply uh, and provide these deep insights for the very first time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rupa. We now have a video message from Dr. Magda Rabalo, an accomplished global health leader, trailblazer, and leading voice for gender equality and social justice over, with over 30 years experience. She's the co-founder and president of the Institute for Global Health and Development. She was Minister of Public Health in her home country, Guinea-Bissau, and one of the only women in the world to lead a national COVID-19 task force. 
I want to applaud Women in Global Health for launching this important report today on women and leadership in global health. I hope it will become an annual publication uh, with each edition gathering evidence on countries to supplement the findings in this report from India, Kenya and Nigeria. We need to understand the diversity of the challenges that face women in accessing global health leadership. And we need more examples of what works to enable women to take their rightful place in leadership alongside men. The pandemic has reminded us that there are no health systems without health workers and that most of the world's health workers are women. Uh, women's leadership is a subject close to my heart and uh, because I know that women leaders can change the agenda and can change the world for the better. In the last three years of the pandemic, significant numbers of health workers in Africa, mostly women, have worked on the pandemic front lines unprotected by vaccines and without adequate personal protective equipment. Inequality within and between countries has deepened since the pandemic, and I'm not surprised by the finding in the report that women have fallen behind in health leadership since the start of the pandemic. Women in Global Health Research in 2020 found that only a minority of COVID-19 task forces uh, were headed by women. It was my privilege to be one of that small number of women as the head of the National COVID-19 Task Force in my home country, Guinea-Bissau. When the pandemic struck, we did not have the resources to buy ventilators or construct new hospitals, and we were short of personal protective equipment. We were short of oxygen, we were short of many other essentials. And when vaccines were being rolled out in Europe and uh, in uh, America uh, and other parts of the developed world, they did not reach people in low income countries. So we focused on public health countermeasures uh, in order to uh, manage the pandemic. And this was mostly at community level. We harnessed the power of women. And in this way, our response was more effective, more robust than the response in some higher income countries. The experience from Guinea-Bissau and many other countries show us that uh, women can be leaders at all levels, from frontline community health service delivery to global health policy making and decisions uh, making. Uh, decision making in health is more effective when informed by the expertise and diverse perspectives of women leaders. Many women health workers have managed huge workloads of sick patients and increased unpaid work at home in the last three years. Many are now very tired, exhausted, and we will need to work hard to keep them in the health profession. One way to keep them will be to enable them to drive decisions made on the health sector they deliver. As we build back our societies, as we build back our economies, as we build back our health systems, we must consider how we can meet the needs of women health workers to ensure they stay with us and that their morale is high. We must ensure their voices are heard and that women have a clear path into leadership. Once again, I would like to commend Women in Global Health for this very important report, and I look forward to continue working with you as you um, make inroads to uh, promote women into leadership positions in global health. Thank you so much to Dr. Rabalo for that great message. It's now time to move to our exciting panel discussion and elevate the voices of these diverse women leaders in health to look at mobilizing action in the health sector towards equity in leadership. We have Ms. Margaret Odira, who is a mentor and mother for and who is living with HIV, and she's a certified community health worker and an advocate working in Nairobi, Kenya. Margaret advocates for community health workers to be recognized as important members of healthcare worker teams and compensated fairly for their work. Margaret also 
admirably received a Women in Global Health Heroines of Health Award in 2022 uh, in recognition of her leadership. We're also joined by Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinoza, an Ecuadorian academic, diplomat, politician, and linguist with over 30 years of experience in academia, NGOs, international organization, and high level government positions. She was the fourth woman in history to be president of the United Nations General Assembly. In Ecuador, she served twice as Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Defense, and Minister of Culture and Heritage. Currently, Espinoza has several advisory roles, including Executive Director of Global Women Leaders Voices for Change and Inclusion, and Chair of the Board of Directors of Women in Global Health. We have with us Dr. Apeju Aderinan, who is an experienced physician of 17 years, combining clinical expertise with public health experience, focusing on local solutions to universal healthcare in Nigeria. She believes that low and middle income country health systems have significant insights to add to global health policy and aligns her career in the direction of making these contributions palpable. Dr. Peju is also the co-lead for the Women in Global Health Nigeria chapter. And last but certainly not least, Professor Madhuka Pai is a Canadian Canada Research Chair, excuse me, in epidemiology, ep epidemiology, global health at McGill University in Montreal. He is the Associate Director of the McGill International TB Centre. He's also a member of the Royal Society of Canada and a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Welcome to all the panelists, and I want to start the discussion. And I want to start with you, Margaret, in Nairobi. Please tell us about your journey to becoming a community health worker leader. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne. I became a community health worker after a personal tragedy. I lost a child and I became HIV positive. Throughout this time, I avoided the support of a local mentor mother. She regularly reached out to me and helped me change my life. Now I do it to my community. I juggle motherhood with the day-to-day -day, uh, community health work. I, I go to house to house looking for HIV positive pregnant and lactating mothers so that we may have eradication of mother to child transmission of HIV. In 2009, I got a job with the Mothers to Mothers program, a contract that lasted for three years. So I received a salary during this time and I was working hand in hand with the community health workers. But I was so much surprised that this community health worker that I'm working hand in hand with is not paid, is not professionalized. And this community health worker was working with passion. So I, I went on working with them uh, until uh, 2017, uh, where my contract ended and I became a community health worker also. We worked hand in hand together and because of the passion that I had in my heart for the children who are uh, from pregnancy to, to five years, I got acquainted with this work so much and I was, I was so much uh, affected when I see a malnourished child or a mother who won't take antiretroviral uh, drugs because I knew that this is a negative impact, will bring a negative impact even in the global health security. And I was called to a Prince Mahidol Award Conference in the year 2020. And when I went there, I found out that I was the only person who was the community health worker in the whole entire uh, conference. And one of the topics that were being discussed there was a community health worker. And I was wondering, one of the topics is about a community health worker who is not even present there. And it, it, I, I kept wondering why. 
And in my, back in my mind, I thought that because 70% of the community health workers are women, it was a double, you know, it, it, it is something that, that catches women and the community health workers at the same time. And I thought in my mind that these are the facts and the realities that, that compromises the global health security. <laughs> If, the, if the, this woman is not empowered, if this community health worker is not paid, if this community health worker is not professionalized, then the global health security of our country and the, and the world at large is compromised. Having an unpaid woman is, is having a, a, a weak uh, global health security. And this is very negative even to our world. Thank you and then, uh, yeah, that, that's what that's why I decided to create a, a a WhatsApp group that is for the for the community health workers. And this I created this WhatsApp group because I saw that these community health workers are not known anywhere. They don't appear anywhere except in the health structure down there. And I felt that it is very important for these community health workers to be together and share ideas. So that is why I decided to, to, to create a, a national association. And this national association started with a, with a, uh, a, 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 unit, a unit that uh, I created for the community health workers. Let and in that, I believe that in future, we are going to be professionalized. Thank you so much. Thank you, Margaret. And you were going on to my next question for you, which was what enabled you? How were you enabled? And what more do community health workers like yourself need in order to take up those leadership positions? So what were the enabling factors for you? Or how were you enabled? And what more needs to be done to ensure that community workers have access to those leadership roles? Yes. What enabled me is the difficult life that I went through. My life itself made me fight for myself. Uh, like when I was, I was detected to be HIV positive, I had, because of the stigma and the rejection that I had for, for in, the, in the society, I decided that I'm not going to die. I decided that I will push through with life until I make it. So uh, life itself pushed me to just uh, think of being a leader. Because when I looked at the women, when I looked at the community health workers, even in our country, they were so much afraid. They were hiding themselves in cocoon because they think that it is very normal to work without pay or uh, in a minimal pay uh, and this is not acceptable even in, in our country. It is not acceptable as a person. I did find it acceptable to make a woman be very comfortable to work without pay or to work with minimal wage because this, is a, this creates a, a compromised global health security. So my own life, my own experience made me to be a fighter. Yeah, and thank you. And actually, thank you, Margaret. I do want to move on to our next speaker, just on the point about what support, what more support uh, community health workers need to take up leader pos leadership positions. One or two things that they might need to take up leadership positions. Okay, uh, women and community health workers need to be professionalized. We need to be supported. We need to be recognized. Because if somebody will ask you, who is this community health worker? Because they don't know. So we need to be recognized because we create a very big impact even in global health. So professionalization, we need more training and we need to be paid to be empowered economically. And I think when, when these uh, this this needs are met, we will be good to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. And I think everybody was inspired listening to your story and, and encouraged. Um, I want to move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinosa from Ecuador. Uh, Maria, thank you so much for joining uh, today's um, event. 
it is a moral imperative to empower women healthcare workers and involve them in higher levels in global health leadership. Could you please expand on this quote and explain why the inclusion of women health workers in global health leadership for you is a moral issue? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just allow me to say uh, thank you. Thank you, Margaret, because it's because of you, it's with you, it's under your inspiration that I think we're all working. Uh, so so thank you for these, uh, for, for sharing this incredible inspirational uh, life story. And, and, uh, and allow me also to start by congratulating uh, Women in Global Health the chapters uh, that were involved, uh, the uh, researchers uh, to this uh, XX Paradox report, which I, I think it's an eye opener of the dimension of underrepresentation of uh, the um, of, of of women in in the health sector in positions of leadership and and beyond. And and I think that numbers matter, and they are indicators that are our societies, our democracies are not doing well, not only on, on the health dimension, but everywhere. These are just indicators and indicators to tell us, you know, loud and clear that we need a, a change, a, a transformation. We need to turn the tide. And let's not believe that improvements uh, on okay. women's representation, on the, uh, on the recognition uh, the uh, profess, um, the um, boosting of women's role in, in roles in in health in terms of the salaries in terms of the capacity building in terms of uh, uh, the professionalized uh, healthcare that we need as margaret was saying you know it's an incremental process so um we are experiencing a strong setback in women's rights and representation worldwide so our advocacy efforts with, with governments, with local governments, with parliaments, with diplomats is of utmost important, importance. And uh, responding to your question, um, Yvonne, I think that empowering and, and including women healthcare workers at all levels of society, it's a moral imperative because it is our right uh, it is an issue of demographic, of social, of, of economic justice, of political justice. So uh, as we have seen, uh, women carry most of the health care burden, uh, forming a large percentage of the health uh, workforce. And yet, you know, decisions having an impact on women and their health and the health of their families and communities uh, should only be made with and through women's leadership considering their lived uh, experiences as we heard you know so strongly uh, from uh, from uh, um, from margaret so women bring a unique approach uh, to to leadership and their our representation uh, helps to move the needle on health outcomes globally uh, as uh, uh, global women leaders, we just launched uh, our flagship report uh, last to, uh, last week in in New York during CSW. In our report, also reflects the presence of women in leadership positions in the key thirty three international organizations. And the outcome was the same as we are witnessing here with the report of women in global health. Um, 44 women out of 335 men holding leadership positions in international organizations from 1945 to 2023. And 13 organizations, one of you know, the most prominent and critical ones, including development banks, have never had a woman leading. And 12% of the time, these organizations have been led by uh, a female. Uh, the rest, the remaining of the time, of course, uh, by men. So there is a lot of homework uh, ahead of us, uh, uh, Yvonne. Uh, this is a moral imperative because it is an indicator of uh, how healthy, how fair, how inclusive and democratic are our societies. And, and of course, the health sector is, is, is a critical indicator of that. 
Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, and I hope you can still hear me clearly, everyone. I'm having some uh, technical difficulties with my video. I want to continue the conversation and I hope you can hear me. Uh, again, back to you, um, Maria. In question number two, you are a member of Global Women Leaders Voices for Change and Inclusion. Uh, global Women Leaders Voices and Change for Inclusion. What strategies have you seen working effectively to enable women across all sectors? What strategies have you seen working effectively in your context to enable women across all sectors? And what actions do you think should be prioritized in the health sector? Well, thank you, Vaughn, for, for your question. And I think, um, Global Women Leaders Voices, which I have uh, the, the privilege to be its uh, CEO, it's a network of uh, 63 women from 40 countries working uh, to make the multilateral system, the international architecture, uh, more uh, gender equal and from a feminist per perspective. So uh, basically, our approach is ensuring that uh, the retooling of the international architecture of the UN system and beyond the UN system has a feminist perspective, not only in terms of the voices and re representation of, of, of women, but looking at, you know, cross-sectorally the role and the space of women in the peace and security agenda, the role and space of women in the sustainable development uh, agenda, the role and space of women in the health and the human rights sector. So I, I we strongly believe as GWL that there are no women's issues. All issues are issues that affect and touch women in different ways. So uh, we have deployed a very strong advocacy work and in some of our work is hand in hand with women in global health and, and I have the privilege to chair the board of women in global health and I said numbers matter of course they matter data matters of course we expect that this re report is going to become a, a live dashboard um that we can, it's the place to go to, to really monitor and see, you know, what are, uh, what is the situation and the, the place and space for women in, in, uh, in the health sector in general and in the global health architecture uh, as, as well. And, and perhaps um, I think that the report has uh, very concrete recommendations that were shared uh, by, by Rupa Dutt uh, when she presented the report. But uh, it's, it's very easy, you know, it's no health decision making should be done or made without the voice, the agency, and the participation of women, not only at the international level, but at the very local level. We heard Margaret telling us, you know, there was a, um, a, a meeting on uh, the role of, of, uh, of uh, uh, healthcare, um, women providing healthcare in communities, and she was the only one, the only female there. This cannot happen not at the local level, nor at the very global international level. So there should be a cross-scale advocacy work that we need to do together. Uh, a focus should be placed in, in, in data, in information, in, in um, um, numbers-driven uh, advocacy. Uh, we need to partner with men as well and uh, and uh, uh, he for she and, and, and male champions to make sure that we do this uh, to, together. And um, I, I would say that this is absolutely critical. So we need, uh, we are in need for allyship uh, in health leadership. And, and, and I think that this is also valid for the health sector, but valid for the way we organize our societies, the way, the way we design the international system. So I don't want to take more time. I, I just would like to close by saying that uh, we really welcome and, and uh, the, the report. Kudos to the team, to Women in Global Health. We really hope to see all this data, this evidence, 
out there as a as a constant live uh, dashboard that we can uh, go to every time that we need uh, to do our advocacy work. And uh, we are privileged and happy to be working hand in hand as uh, a global women leaders voices uh, to make our collective voices uh, heard and being uh, inspired every day by the healthcare airings like uh, Margaret today. So thank you very much. Congrats, kudos for this report. And over to you, Yvonne. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Espinosa. Amazing contribution there and insights. Let me bring in Dr. Peju Adeniran, um, who is speaking to us from the UK, but works in Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Peju, thank you so much for taking the time to participate um, in this interesting discussion. In the country case studies, you looked at perceptions of leadership among women working in health. What did you learn about the relationship between gender and leadership? Okay, thank you very much, Yvonne. Very honored to be here. And thank you to everybody um, who is here. Um, it was a very, very interesting um, research to work on because um, we wanted to go deeper beyond our lived experiences um, of women who work in um, public health, global health, especially being from the South. Uh, so we wanted to see the data beyond a collection of our lived experiences. First of all, the thing that struck um, us very early on as the data came on was how similar the scenarios were. It felt mm. as though one was looking at the same place several times instead of several places at once. Uh, that was immediately very apparent. Um, and um, tellingly, it then was sad to find the confirmation of what we had experienced in our lived lives and that not much had shifted and not much was looking to shift, except there was a deliberate attempt to push. One thing that we were determined to um, elicit from all the data that was coming in was, it was important to us to show the relationship between gender and leadership. In other words, what's happening under responsible for what we're seeing on top. So the perception of leadership by women themselves was very important to us to get at because we felt it could be speaking on their behalf to say women should be in leadership or women wanted to be in leadership. So we wanted them to speak on their own behalf about leadership. We were also deliberate in not creating any frames around what health leadership meant. So there couldn't be any preformed ideas. We didn't want that. We didn't want to interfere. So we had a very open frame for looking at the perception of women, um, perception of leadership by women who work there and very interesting um, insights. What came out was that um, the way women perceived leadership and the way they perceived their yearnings or aspirations for leadership were slightly different to how the systems in which they worked in perceived leadership. And that was a key to understanding what, was, um, what, what we were seeing as a triangle. When women define leadership, we were able to find themes of duty of care, responsibility, um, nurturing, and um, being responsible to the people that they served. We contrast this to um, the system's understanding of leadership, which were likely to be very structural, educational achievements, um, um, stereotypes bordering on strength, aggression, giving direction, and um, uh, uh, looking the part, 
looking the part is really complex, but I will put that. So what we found was women already understood that they were doing the work, but they were impregnated in system, systems that didn't exactly share, um, uh, didn't exactly share their own vision of how they were doing the work. So in other words, and one of the key um, aspects of the report, one of the respondents that we focused on, and which is why people like Margaret come up again, is that people like Margaret hold up the system. Yep. Universal health is delivered by community health workers who are unpaid, who are actually delivering the mm -hmm. health up to last mile. And these women understand their role and they understand in um, places like Nigeria, Kenya and India, without what these women are actually doing, then the um, pyramid that puts the men on top would not actually be held up by anything. However, when you look in a room of leaders, you can't find these women. We can hardly get them to be paid. So there is a difference in ideology between the people who are doing the service and the people who are scoring and um, sort of holding the system up, right? So that for us was very, very interesting to see. Absolutely fascinating, uh, Dr. Peichu. Um, then my next question would be, what has been the importance then of women's movements and collective action in your own leadership journey? How important has that been? Yes. Um, I will piggyback off my last, um, my last point, which is sometimes it is about recognizing to the women themselves that you are the leaders that you are looking up to. What was um, important to me was to understand, accept, and now proclaim that I am the leader I am waiting for. So imagine for about 70% of the health workforce being able to internalize um, their own contribution and their own self-worth and their own um, aspirations to leadership and see what will happen when that internalization of that power um, is allowed to shift the systems. That happened for me because I didn't grow up seeing as many women as I would have liked um, doing, um, leading the systems in which I worked in. However, I was very fortunate to meet people with similar problems at the same time. I work in Nigeria. So I thought that this is a problem that is um, held by the cultural um, um, dimensions of the society that I live in, the patriarchy and the systems that don't um, encourage women like me to be in the system only to find um, with women in global health that there were very um, intense similarities in my system and high income uh, systems. That was such, you know, and then we then decided that women in the global South couldn't do it alone, but neither could women in the global North. So it's about everyone getting into the room together and showing besides our lived experiences using data and actual research to show what we know, that at least half of the talent pool in the global health space is underutilized. And not just underutilized, it's um, deliberate to keep it that way by first not allowing people who are contributing to understand and value their own contribution so that the system can continue to undervalue their contribution. In our research and our studies, we found community health workers who had been working for more than 15 years in voluntary positions. Just like Margaret said, that is a weak link in global security. When the pandemic hit 
And in Nigeria and many places in Africa, technology couldn't save us as quickly as we wanted. But we were saved with the contribution of women who contributed other skills, tracing, information, behavioral modification. Um, those skills were very essential to the pandemic response in our country, but those skills are largely unpaid. So coming together and bringing everybody into the room was very important in my leadership journey. It's been very important in women in global health. And what we continue to do in women in global health is to ensure that um, we keep all our, um, our momentum and energy behind with data, behind the women who are holding up this system. And that is our key mission in Women in Global Health, um, one which I'm very proud and very honored to do in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paige. Thank you so much for that contribution. Um, lots of interesting thoughts there and lots of interesting comments coming in and thoughts in the chat, which I hope can be archived so we can also go through them uh, later on. And I hope we will be able to share a recording of this webinar for those who couldn't participate with us today. Um, uh, last but not least, I want to turn to, before we head towards the, the final question, which I'll pose to all panelists, is Professor Maduka Pai uh, in Canada. Thank you so much for patiently listening to, to all the ladies uh, speak. Um, Professor, what does gender transformative leadership mean to you? Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I want to share an image which I've been working on for the last day or two and trying to figure out what I could um, um, bring to this uh, panel, and I hope you can you can see the see the slide. Basically, I think we have mountains of data now from women in global health, from global health fifty fifty, and a whole series of research studies, uh, which are probing the question of what is wrong with global health structurally. And I think if you asked a simple question, who leads global health today at the highest level? And I, I think it's the intersection of these three circles, global north, men, white people. And the confluence of those three circles is the group that dominates global health at every level possible. And this is not my opinion, this is what the data say. And then what happens when we wanna make a change, you start to see that white men are replaced by white women in leadership roles, but it still remains global not focused. It is still, I think in my opinion, might be seen as incremental progress, but fundamentally, structurally, I don't think it deviates much from the current systems of power and privilege. What I think this report does beautifully by centering on Kenya, Nigeria, and India, and by centering on intersectionality, this report beautifully illustrates that the last set of circles is the least represented in all of global health. Global South people, women, black women. It is that group that truly needs to be in a leadership role. And to me, if we can get there in global health, that would be genuine transformative leadership in global health. I think everything else would be tinkering at the margins and not fundamentally addressing the deep power asymmetry that pervades all of global health. And to me, this transition, and I keep asking myself, is it really necessary to go through those incremental changes or could we directly leapfrog and identify the, the groups that truly need to be in a leadership role? And when we've tried to do that as an editor-in-chief, along with Catherine Kyobutanji, my fellow editor-in-chief of PLOS Global Public Health, and Rupa is one of our section editors, we've tried very hard to recruit women of color from the Global South to be uh, editors. And many of them respond to us and say, we are delighted to be asked, we are very honored, but our current systems are not supportive of us. We don't have the administrative support. 
We don't have support within families. So as much as we would like to be in these leadership roles, we are currently not able to accept it. And so this is the challenge we, we face. So I would like to end by saying it's not enough to offer leadership. I think that offer of leadership should come with the whole support package. Otherwise, we set women up for failure because we are offering them a chance to lead, but we are not giving them the resources, the money, the administrative and other support that they need to succeed. I have seen so many units being created on EDI or DEI and, and women of color are being asked to lead them with no budget attached to them. What kind of a leadership offer is that? And, and this is, it's, the fact that this is happening tells me that, that these DEI initiatives are not serious. They are literally pushing women into these very difficult places only to fail. And then, then that, this becomes an excuse to scrap all diversity inclusion efforts because they say, oh, this hasn't worked out well. Back to you, Yvonne. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. I, think I hope you can still hear me. I'm having some technical challenges, but I believe you can all hear me. I wasn't quite uh, finished with you, Professor. Really interesting insights there and very interesting slides. So given what you said, what recommendations do you therefore have for mobilizing male allyship in global health? What, recommend, what recommendations, sorry, do you have for mobilizing male allyship in global health? Thank you. I mean, there have been a few blog posts on male allyship, one or two webinars and meetings, but I don't think male allyship in global health is a mainstream topic yet for discussion. And just as I um, have seen, I mean, I don't know how many of you can make out I have, a, I have a feeling 90% of this audience today is women. Where are the men and why are they not showing up for these sorts of uh, events, for these sorts of initiatives? It's, it's the same as we, I have attended uh, discussions on um, racism in global health and white people are missing in the room, right? It's the exact same equivalent that I see that men don't see themselves as, as being uh, that, that they don't feel the need to be engaged in these sorts of discussions and white people don't feel the need to be engaged in, in uh, discussions around racism and anti-racism and both of them couldn't be more wrong. White people have to dismantle white supremacy and men have to dismantle uh, patriarchy. Now, how do we do this uh, structurally? I would argue that established men uh, people like me, to be honest, uh, people who are senior, who are, you know, have, have reached a stage of their career where a 300th paper doesn't really matter to them, yet another award doesn't matter to them. I would argue that they need to be the number one group that leans out because they have nothing to lose, to be honest. They are so decorated and, and, and privileged that for them, it takes them no effort whatsoever to give up opportunities, whatever they may be, that may be coming their way. For, for the others, I, I hear two viewpoints. My wife, who is a woman in global health, uh, I was discussing uh, this with my wife and daughter last night. My wife says men just should just quit the room. They should just get out and not even be around. So that's one, one uh, viewpoint. And I can see why uh, she's saying that. I think there are, we know men with very toxic leadership qualities. And their mere continued presence in the room, I think, is still damaging. Even if a woman takes their place, they still cast a big shadow. And I think such people should just completely retire and leave. But for the others, I don't think we should give up because we still have an allyship role to play. We will not be the leaders, but we are there in the background, quietly doing the hard work and being supportive and doing the kind of tasks that we are good at and we could be doing. So here I would say, um, maybe women in global health, this is a suggestion to, to Rupa and all of you, maybe you need to create a, a male ally chapter that people could sign up to be a part of, right? We are not the ones, we are, we are not leaders in women in global health. We are the ally chapter and, and we go and bring more and more men into this. At a minimum, we need to be educated. We need to show up for these events. We need to understand, and I'll end with that by saying, 
I keep asking why men are so reluctant to, 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 to get involved in this area. Is it because we are not seeing the damage that an all male perspective brings to global health? Mm -hmm. Are we not seeing the devastation of war, the poor response to the COVID pandemic, the disastrous response to climate change? Much of this is, is done by men. So why is it that we're not seeing the disastrous effects that an all male leadership, just like an, a whiteness brings to global health, right? Both whiteness and maleness are harmful in the end. And both white people and men have to learn how dangerous it is for the world to only have them running the show and then rethink why they need to get engaged in this space. So let's think more creatively about how to bring more uh, male, male allies into this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, and some very thought-provoking comments there. Lots of interesting comments also in the chat box, which I hope everybody can uh, go into and have a look at. Uh, we're drawing towards the end of this really fascinating, inspiring, inspiring and forward-thinking uh, look at challenging uh, the status quo. And I want to uh, start to draw to a close by um, going back to uh, our panelists with uh, a final question uh, for all of you. Margaret, I want to start with you in Nairobi, and I hope you're still with us and can hear uh, very clearly. And then I will ask uh, Maria and, and Paige you, and then back to you, uh, Madhu. What, therefore, is your call to action? for the Commission on the Status of Women uh, Leadership in Health, which is meeting now this week, the UN meeting. What is your call uh, to action? Let's start with Margaret and then yourself, Maria, and then Paige, you and then Madhu. Uh, please, if you could keep your responses to a minute. Margaret, the call to action. Okay, my call to action to the leaders and the policy makers out there is to support every chapter that women are involved, like community health workers, the places that are a good percentage of women are involved, kindly recognize us, put us in high places where we can, we can be examples of women who are demoralized, who don't think that they matter. When, when someone sees women who are up there, if we are, we are, are uplifted. The other women will be uh, will know that I they can also uh, be uplifted. So recognize us, uh, pay us, professionalize us. Yeah, thank you. You are on mute, Yvonne. Thank you very much. I said, Maria, over <laughs> to you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well. Basically, I would repeat, recognize us, pay us, yeah. professionalize us, mm -hmm. give us the power that we deserve. That's what Margaret is saying. And I'm just repeating this because it's critical. Mm -hmm. And I would add perhaps uh, that we need a feminist multilateral system so global norms and standards and instruments and mechanisms are put in place. So uh, there is true power sharing in uh, international health governance. And I think that reports uh, like the XXX paradox, it's really telling us that there is a lot of work ahead of us. Advocacy, influence, showcasing life experiences like uh, our heroine here, Margaret, I think really, really helps. And allyship with men, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was uh, so encouraged uh, to hear Professor uh, Madhukar uh, say, yes, we need more men in the room. We need more feminist men in the room uh, like him. So uh, a lot of homework to do and, uh, but uh, it brings us you know, hope and, and resolve uh, to see that we can change the tide uh, in, uh, in um, you know, the role of women in a feminist global health system, but also healthcare systems at the, at the national and local level that are led, influenced by women. No health 
care without women in positions of leadership. And I agree with Dr. Uh, Peju when she said, we are not predefining what power and leadership means because it can mean different things, you know, but uh, power sharing and leadership for women in the health sector. That's what uh, it's our ask today. And thank you again, Yvonne, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. And uh, let's take it over to yourself now, Dr. Peju, and then uh, to Madhu. Thank you so much, Margaret. And thank you so much, Maria. So I will um, just stand behind both Margaret and Maria, and I will add the element of mechanisms, which Maria so can. Um, the mechanisms is to keep tracking open, allow tracking. So if we, uh, the information should be um, public, timely, and accessible. Because the reason why all of this was um, is is hiding in plain sight is the opaqueness of information and data, and um, if systems are willing, you can almost predict how willing systems are to change by how willing they are to reveal. So allow tracking mechanisms to work. Let the information on the amount of women doing the work be available. Let the information on your budgets that show how, frankly, atrocities like holding up a system on unpaid labor um, to, to persist because the information is not accessible, is not trackable, so we're unable to So if we are able, and this is our call, um, to keep the pressure, as it were, it's a Nigerian saying, but you keep the pressure on the data, you keep the pressure on the information, and we keep the pressure on people that are accountable to us. And by us, I mean everyone, it's our health system. So to keep yourselves accountable to the people you serve means your data and your information must no longer be opaque. What are you afraid of? That's my final word. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Pedro Bravo, indeed. I, I see you clapping, Memoria. And a final word from you, Professor, uh, before we uh, begin to wind up on this fascinating and thought-provoking discussion. Uh, Madhu. Well, for what it's worth, I'll speak uh, to all men now. Um, as few as they are here, that uh, we have a lot to uh, work to do. Um, I think the world is a dangerous place when only men are leading it. And, and there's plenty of evidence. Um, the, the war and conflicts that we see are a stunning example of that. Uh, the disastrous COVID response and climate change response uh, only add to what I'm saying. So if we want to survive ourselves, we need to start um, having diverse uh, leadership. And then um, I love the comment somebody made in the chat box. Uh, how about a men for women in global health chapter? Uh, if we could create something like that, I would be the first one to join, but also invite many other men to join the cause and actually do something concrete so that you have a pool of uh, male allies that you could call upon to do whatever it is that needs to get done. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's as simple as retweeting someone, amplifying someone. Um, small things do add up and, and make a big difference. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for, for, for those final, final words from uh, the four of you, the four panelists. Um, and I want to thank all of you for those incredible thoughts, ideas, and answers. Uh, I would like to turn now, finally, uh, to Dr. Shabna Sarfraz, Global Director for Gender and Health, Women in Health. She is a senior development professional with more than 15 years of leadership experience. Prior to joining Women in Global Health, she was a member of the Social Sector and Devolution Planning Commission for the Government of Pakistan in Islamabad. Uh, she was one of the inaugural 2019 Jane G. Sun Women in Global Health League Fellows at Harvard, 
where she conducted research into the barriers to women in health career advancement in Pakistan. Handing over to you, Dr. Safraz, to close this fascinating webinar. Thank you again to all the panelists. On behalf of Women in Global Health, I want to thank all our inspiring speakers today and our moderator, UN, who has guided the discussion immaculately. We've all heard loud and clear today that women, despite being the majority in the health sector, are still marginalized in health leadership, with women from the global south particularly underrepresented. The research Women in Global Health has undertaken on the state of women's leadership and global health has confirmed that the pandemic has not catalyzed an equal role for women in health leadership. Women health workers have been applauded for their exceptional contribution to health and saving lives in the pandemic, but not rewarded. They are now expected to return to unequal pay or no pay, widespread sexual harassment at work, PPE and the workplace policies that are designed majorly for men and their lives and just a 25% share in decision making, and even that not so in the low middle income countries. In short, as they're being asked to return to business as usual, it means gender inequality as usual. However, women are vocalizing a desire for the pandemic to serve as a departure from history and that it is time to build back equal. Our headline conclusion is, that women's underrepresentation in health leadership impacts negatively both on the women affected and on the health systems. It is therefore everybody's business. Commitments now decades old have confirmed women's right to equality in decision making, but change indeed is very slow and may have ground to a halt. Our findings from India, Kenya and Nigeria show that the gender imbalance in health leadership will not change fast enough with time alone. Women working in health are being denied their right to equal leadership, while health systems at the same time are being denied the expertise of leaders who know these systems better than anyone. The systemic bias exposed by this research illustrates how workplace with human resource policies designed for the default man give men an advantage over women in access to leadership. Men gain from this male bonus syndrome because they are advantaged by the rules and also because women are eliminated from the competition. Change is now needed urgently at all levels from individual to national, legal and policy frameworks and to global conventions. Closing this gender gap in health leadership is a critical foundation for strong health systems and health for all. There was a 10 million health worker shortage when the pandemic started, and the evidence now is that the burnt out women health workers are leaving the profession. We mm -hmm. cannot afford to lose even one of these expert women. Women in this research are telling us what they need to succeed, and feasible policy solutions are out there. Women are asking for more than simply policy measures that enable them to work more easily within existing gendered roles. They're asking for gender transformative policy measures that will intentionally enable more equal sharing of work and childcare between men and women so that both can fulfill their potential at work. The answer is not to fix women, to fit into workplace systems, but to fix the systemic bias that creates barriers for women. All health leaders must adopt a gender transformative leadership approach to intentionally build equity in the health workforce and in global health decision-making roles. Women health workers need a new social contract based on equality and an equal role in health leadership. When we get this right, health can be an exemplar sector, generating gender transformative lessons for the rest of the economy. We know how to fix this and the potential gains for health systems, social change and economic growth make gender equity in the health workforce an unbeatable investment. Thank you for joining us today. Stay with Glo Women and Global Health for the next steps of this journey towards equity in global health, where we hope we will be joined by many more male allies like Professor Madhupai today. With these final words, I now close this webinar.